So, in fact, what you can say is, uh, you know, generally pancreas, intestine, or multi. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Mohanta, you are on mute. Yeah, got it. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, so nothing, just uh, wanted to... Uh, so, uh, so a lot of people huh, are joining in. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hello, Dr. Sora. Hello. 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 Join. Just give us just one or two minutes more. Very good morning, Dr. Ravi. Hi. So just give us two minutes. Our rest of the team is. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> Start up. Oh. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we can begin now. I'm Sunana Singh from Organ India, an initiative of the NGO Parasha Foundation. Hey, and Organ India, in association with Civil Hospital Panchkula, have been working closely to promote the organ donation and transplant program in the district. As a part of that program, we will be holding uh, webinars regularly with esteemed guests from around the country. Uh, the first webinar today is on recent trends in liver disease and transplant by our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Ravi Mohanka, who is Director, Hepatobiliary Surgery and Liver Transplant, HN Reliance Hospital, Mumbai. Many thanks to you, Dr. Mahanka, and many thanks to Dr. Veena Singh, DGHS Haryana, Dr. Suvi Saxena, Principal of Medical Officer, Civil Hospital Panchkala, and Dr. Payal, DMS, Civil Hospital Panchkala. I now invite Dr. Saxena to please introduce the session and welcome the speaker. Good afternoon, and, yeah, Dr. Uh, Saxena, please. Am I audible clearly now? Yes, yes. Okay. And on behalf of uh, Civil Hospital Panchkula, I welcome everybody, uh, especially Dr. Ravi Mahanka and Dr. Sinana. I'm so thankful to you. You have associated with us and uh, given strength to our, the, the transplant program. As such, uh, our government had, uh, the department has been telling us key to strengthen this program. It is and generally, we know that organ transplant is less developed as compared to Mumbai, Maharashtra, and South India. So we have started taking big steps. And uh, so, and today we have a very learned uh, speaker with us, Dr. Ravi Mahanka. Although he needs no introduction, but still, when I was going through his profile, I had gone, I will introduce that to you. Uh, Dr. Ravi Mohanka is a director, hepatobiliary surgery and liver transplant, HN Reliance Hospital, Mumbai. He was previously chief surgeon and head of the department of hepatopancreatobiliary and liver transplant surgery at Global Hospitals, Mumbai. His unit is one of the fastest growing programs with success rates of acute liver failure and liver transplant at par with the best in the world. Dr. Manka has trained and worked at some of the most hey, hospitals in India and US, including the Thomas E. Stahl Transplantation Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. His areas of expertise and current practice include living donor and deceased donors, cadaveric liver transplantation, which he has done about 1,500, inter intestinal transplantation, pancreatic trans transplantation, which he has done about 20, and hepatobiliary surgeries in adults and children. He has undergone advanced training in laparoscopic and robotic liver surgery at leading institutes in France and Italy. He has organized, conducted, and chaired many national and international level conferences, delivered faculty lectures, presented and published his research work at scientific meetings and international journals. So I think even this is not enough but this will give you a brief about the person who is going to 
talk to us, speak to us, and lecture us today. Thank you, Dr. Ravi Mohaka. Thank you so much for your most welcome here. Thank you very much, sir. And thanks for the kind introduction uh, uh, very much. Uh, so the topic for discussion for today is what are the recent trends in liver disease and in transplantation? Now that you have embarked on a transplant program in Panchkula, not only there will be organ donation involved, but also a lot of uh, possibility that in the future you will be doing transplants also, not just kidney, but liver and heart and other transplants also. So since you've started this journey, it is... Uh, important that we discuss these and so you will have a good idea about what is there in the future for uh, you. So, uh, so I understand that most of the participants are uh, doctors of various specialities in the hospital, isn't it? So as we all know, uh, liver is like a factory and it performs more than 500 vital functions in the body. Uh, not only will it uh, do the reg uh, ob more obvious things like metabolic function, for example, detoxification of uh, toxins, drugs, bilirubin, but make a lot of proteins which are not only related to the muscle building in your body, but also related to the antibodies and therefore the immune system of the body. It regulates blood clotting through all these proteins. It will also... Uh, uh, it's also responsible for uh, glucose metabolism and glycogen metabolism in a major way. It's also responsible for the uh, temperature regulation in our body. And through bile, it's also responsible for uh, digesting, especially the fats in our body. So we are aware of how important uh, the function of the liver is and how critical it is for uh, our survival. Unlike liver, other organs such as kidney, pancreas and heart, where they generally perform one critical function. And there are a lot of technologies that are now becoming available where one, uh, a artificial kidney or artificial pancreas or artificial heart will still be in, uh, will very soon be in clinical practice where you may just have to uh, 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 give a small machine to somebody to replace that function when it fails. But it's going to be almost impossible for us to make an artificial liver because it performs so many of such functions. So what are the types of diseases that we see? Uh, is there some, uh, ma'am is trying to say something, is it? Dr. Saxena? Just an interruption for a second. Our um, senior most, uh, the civil surgeon of uh, Panchkula, she's a pediatrician also. She would um, uh, introduce herself and the team for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please, 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 please go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Namaskar, okay. Namaskar Dr. Ravi. I am Dr. Mukta Kumar. I am pediatrician and civil surgeon, district Panchkula. So thank you so much that you have spared so uh, such a precious time of yours for delivering uh, a helpful lecture for the doctors of Panchkula district and I feel it will be helpful in basically in uh, uh, in evolving their idea about liver transplant and we are also uh, running a program on organ donation uh, on a very uh, rapid basis and we will be starting uh, a district wide organ donation uh, basically uh, yeah, basically a program on organ donation and we will uh, we we are trying to motivate all our health staff to fill all the forms regarding the uh, donation for the organs and we will, we have already prepared a help desk and a counter and a special uh, launch program will be done by uh, probably health minister or so in our district so i think uh, it will be needed in future also on a regular basis uh, so that people will be motivated and, and at least our doctors are at least aware of the uh, probable consequences and probable needs which are available in cases of uh, liver failure. So thank you so much for sparing uh, your precious time and uh, you please continue. Sorry to interrupt you. I was busy in meeting at that time. No problem, ma'am. In fact, I think that uh, real impetus to the organ donation program will happen once you start the transplant program. 
because that way there is a major reason why the organ donation program has to be successful and that will happen it's just a matter of time that we have all, uh, already planned to start next month so wonderful we'll next month in coordination with pgi chandigarh wonderful yeah best of luck for that program ma'am and thanks a lot for the invitation thank you sir all right so then we'll start continue with the talk and so basically when we look at liver diseases they are divided into two broad categories one is chronic liver disease or cirrhosis and the other is acute liver failure and then there is sometimes a mixture of both which is acute on chronic liver failure so when we encounter liver cirrhosis <clears throat> what we get is a, a liver which is shrunken it has become stiff and the blood is unable to flow through it freely so therefore there is portal hypertension the most common reasons for this is hepatitis b hepatitis c fatty liver disease which is becoming a common problem currently alcoholic liver disease and autoimmune hepatitis and other such diseases also now we all know that liver is one of the unique organs in our body that has the capacity to regenerate so if there is any injury to the liver there is capacity to regenerate so if that is true why would there be a situation where the liver uh, will be permanently damaged even chronically the reason is that although the hepatocytes or the liver cells in patients with cirrhosis individually have the capacity to regenerate but because of the fibrosis they get trapped into small nodules and because of that they are unable to regenerate and therefore patients with liver cirrhosis eventually because of failure of regeneration they tend to develop liver failure <clears throat> on the other hand for when acute liver failure happens these uh, this kind of liver failure typically happens in young patients with no pre existing liver disease so their liver is absolutely normal it has no uh, disease over the many years of their life but because of an insult such as hepatitis a or e infection or some drug induced uh, problems or poisoning or sometimes in pregnancy they go into acute liver failure now these patients do not have liver cirrhosis meaning they don't have nodules in their liver they have normal hepatocytes but more than 90 95% of their hepatocytes are uh, have undergone necrosis because of this uh, injuries one of these injuries such patients have a potential for region uh, recovery because of regeneration and therefore if this, these patients can be uh, kept stable and an environment is provided to the liver for uh, regeneration to happen then these patients can recover so while a lot of patients with chronic liver disease or liver cirrhosis they are unlikely to recover although the progression of disease is very slow so a typical liver cirrhosis patients will take about 20 to 30 years to develop liver cirrhosis on the other hand patients with acute liver failure they will develop liver failure within days sometimes weeks but their uh, liver failure has a potential for recovery then there is third type of liver failure which is acute on chronic liver failure obviously this type of liver failure is the worst of the two because there is an existing underlying liver disease which is very similar to liver cirrhosis but on top of it there is a, some acute damage now this typically happens in patients with alcoholic liver disease where a patient has uh, injury to the liver because of alcohol usage for many years 20 25 years or sometimes even more and on top of that they consume a large amount of alcohol in a short period of time what is called as binge drinking now because of this binge drinking their liver suddenly goes into failure and that type of liver failure is acute on chronic liver failure and those are very difficult because these patients tend to have multi organ failure and very severe kind of liver failure so these patients have are the most difficult to manage and even uh, with a treatment like transplant also the success rates are not as good as those of uh, liver cirrhosis or acute liver failure so similarly patients who have uh, chronic liver disease like liver cirrhosis they may not be aware that they have liver cirrhosis like we discussed these patients develop liver uh, failure or over 20 to 30 years during this period they may absolutely have no symptoms at all and they may not be aware that they have liver disease 
but somebody who has liver disease may have these symptoms fever this is generally when it happens in an acute phase when the hepatitis a e or b infection has uh, been acquired by the patient but because there are so many reasons for fever you would not think of hepatitis a or e unless they also have jaundice or other things to suggest that they have liver disease then similarly there may have loose motion especially with hepatitis a or e but again loose motion and fever both are non specific symptoms they are not specific for uh, hepatitis a or e so therefore we tend to uh, investigate them for typhoid and other diseases but may not reach a conclusion or may not be able to diagnose hepatitis a or e unless or until and unless they have also have jaundice but then patients who have chronic liver disease they tend to have none of these symptoms and over maybe 20 25 years they may be completely asymptomatic they are often diagnosed when they do a ultrasound for some other problem or they develop liver failure in the form of one of these symptoms now one of these symptoms could be jaundice confusion or irrelevant talking which is encephalopathy swelling on feet or ascites which is swelling in the abdomen or vomiting uh, blood vomiting or melina meaning uh, black colored stools so once patients develop one of these things then we know that they have liver cirrhosis but we also know that they have developed advanced liver cirrhosis or liver failure so unfortunately at this stage it is uh, uh, the first time that the patient or the doctor has seen this patient and it is very difficult to reverse the disease at this stage so one of the main problems that we face with liver disease is our inability to diagnose them early because they do not have any symptoms or may, um, very few patients have uh, symptoms so therefore most of the liver disease is generally diagnosed when we do them we when we test them either doing a routine health checkup or they have undergone a ultrasound or sonography because of some other reason or sometimes we do an endoscopy because of any reason and we find that they have liver disease so therefore we have to have a high threshold of suspicion or low threshold for suspicion when we are dealing with somebody who has history of jaundice then we should try to get the liver function test or ultrasound uh, at least to know whether they have an underlying liver disease especially patients who have metabolic syndrome such as diabetes hypertension uh, cardiac disease these patients are at a high risk of developing fatty liver which is also now considered part of uh, the metabolic syndrome itself but these patients we should get an ultrasound and a liver function test because they may be harboring a, a fatty liver which we may not be aware of and which may be asymptomatic and uh, although at the stage of fatty liver it is possible to reverse it at the stage of cirrhosis it's not possible to reverse it so catching the disease early is going to be the key to uh, try to treat it uh, appropriately and early there are several other things that have become available recently one of them is a fibro scan so here uh, uh, what we do is we put a probe uh, in a ultrasound machine and this probe will give a shock wave through the liver and then catch the uh, uh, resultant wave and give us a number which will tell us how stiff the liver is and that will be a indirect way to know whether the liver has some fibrosis or some cirrhosis so this is becoming increasingly important in our uh, practice use of a fibro scan there are other tests which can be used for determining the stiffness of the liver uh, similar to fibro scan one of them is a mre magnetic resonance elastography which is a add on module on the mri machine and it will tell us about the stiffness of the liver and then there is liver biopsy which is again something that we do when the routine lft or the sonography and the fibro scan does not give us an answer about the cause or severity of liver disease in that situation we have to probably do a biopsy which will tell us not about uh, not only about what kind of inflammation or uh, damage is there to the liver but also it will tell us about the stage of fibrosis how much of fibrosis has happened whether cirrhosis has happened or not and sometimes we are able to diagnose the cause of liver cirrhosis also or liver disease in general and then there is hvpg which is the hepatic venous pressure gradient this is something that we do through the uh, right jugular vein and we put a catheter through the right jugular vein and measure the pressure inside the liver with this we will be able to know whether there is any portal hypertension that the patient has so 
not only the routine LFTs and sonographies, but also some other tests like fibro scan, a biopsy, and HVPG may be required for us to uh, diagnose the cause as well as the severity of liver disease. Let's talk about the chronic liver disease first. And uh, I'll try to uh, get uh, into the details as well as try to keep it simple. Now, one of the most common reasons for uh, liver cirrhosis is hepatitis C. We uh, know that almost 80% of patients who acquire hepatitis C, they, their immune system will cure it on its own after in about 80% of cases. But in about 20% cases, it will lead to chronic inflammation of the liver. Because of chronic inflammation, there will be fibrosis and subsequently cirrhosis. But in about 2-6% to 6 of patients per year of having cirrhosis, they will develop liver cancer also. So, this is a disease which used to be our major problem up until five years ago. But in uh, uh, 2017, we got, in uh, 2016, we got this new drug called as sophosphobit. Before 2016, we used to treat these patients with weekly injections uh, of interferon for about one year. And only about 50% patients used to respond to this treatment. And almost 30% of patients, of the ones who have responded also, they would get recurrence of hepatitis C. So it was a bad disease to have and there was, the treatment was very difficult. Almost like having chemotherapy, you know, their platelet counts will fall and they will feel extremely weak. So it was a difficult treatment for the patients with hepatitis C. And again, it was not curative in most patients. So in almost uh, 30 to 40% patients uh, would uh, get cured of the infection, but almost 70% patients would not have got cured with this treatment also, despite undergoing such a difficult treatment. But now, since 2016, we have this new drug called as sophosphovir, and that allows us to cure hepatitis C in about three months' time with, and with a tablet uh, alone. So with three months, almost 95% plus patients can be treated with, uh, and not just treated, but cured of hepatitis C. Although this is a great achievement for us over the last five years, but it still does not uh, solve two problems. One is patients who have advanced liver disease already and the ones who have liver cancer or HCC. So therefore, these two patients may still require a transplant, but uh, most of hepatitis C patients can now be treated with medicines alone. The second pro major problem that we face is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a very virulent disease, so it spreads pretty fast and a lot, the incidence or prevalence in the society is actually quite huge. So for any disease to have about 4% prevalence in the society uh, is quite uh, a large one. Unfortunately, most patients do not know that they have hepatitis B because they don't have any symptoms again because this is a chronic disease. So they will first, their first symptom may happen when they... Uh, uh, develop liver failure, but most often these patients are diagnosed when they go for blood uh, donation. And that's when they undergo the routine hepatitis B, C testing, and that's how, when it is diagnosed. But uh, uh, the impact that hepatitis B will have on our liver or on our body depends on not the virus. It depends on how your immune system responds to the virus. So, in about 90% people, the immune system will have a normal response to hepatitis B infection and it will clear the virus in about two to six months time. In such patients, when we do a hepatitis B surface antigen, HBSAG test, we will find that it is negative and the liver function test will also be normal and these patients actually do not require any treatment at all. But these patients may have hepatitis B core antibody positivity, which is an indicator of past infection. The second is, I'll cover the no response first. So second category is when the patient gets hepatitis B infection and there is your immune system doesn't respond at all. Now these patients also, actually there is not much damage to the liver because the immune system has not responded. So therefore the real damage to the liver in hepatitis B app happens because of the response of immune system, not because of the virus actually. So in such patients, what will happen is if you do a HBSAG test, it will be positive. If you do a HBE antigen test, that will also be positive because there is active virus in the body. 
or it may be negative if there is no active replication in the body. But the liver function test or the ASGPT will be normal. So therefore, these patients will have hepatitis B in their body. And in the past, they would be called as carriers. Now they are called as chronic hepatitis B infection patients. But because there is no damage to the liver, there is no antiviral treatment required. They just require close follow-up because they are still infective to other members in the family. And you should vaccinate all members in the family. Now we come to the more important uh, part of hepatitis B, which is when the immune system has improper response. What that means is that either the immune system can respond very aggressively or it can sub, uh, react suboptimally or inadequately. So when the immune system reacts very aggressively, much more than what is required to clear the virus, these patients have a massive amount of damage to the liver and they go into acute liver failure. With this type of immune system response is called as fulminant response and they go into acute liver failure because there are hepatitis B virus in all cells of the liver because it, the DNA of the virus gets impregnated into the hepatocytes. But if the immune system responds very aggressively, then it will try to kill all cells that has the virus, which means almost all cells of the liver. And therefore, these patients have acute liver failure and they require an emergency transplant. The second situation, when the immune system responds, but it's an inadequate response. Uh, in this situation, these patients will have HBS AG positivity, HBE antigen positivity, and their LFTs will be abnormal. The SGPT will be high, raised. Now, these are the patients who require antiviral treatment, chronic hepatitis, and these patients will benefit from the antiviral treatment. In the past, so this is a brief thing of uh, how do we manage a hepatitis B patient. So if they have the, uh, the treatment depends on three things. One is what is their E antigen status? Then is the SGPT or ALT elevated? We always do a hepatitis B DNA to see what how high it is and how do we treat it? So if somebody who has got hepatitis E antigen positivity and uh, uh, LFT is abnormal, DNA is high, treat them. E antigen is negative, SGPT is elevated, or even though the DNA may be not uh, high, very high, treat it. But if they are inactive carriers, which means that SGPT is normal, DNA may be high or low, you don't need treatment, but you need to follow up these patients closely. So these are the four situations in which we treat the patients or do not treat the patient. Now, one of the things here is that in the past, we used to have this drug lamivudine, which is freely available and very cheap. And then there were two new drugs that came, Entecavir and Tenofovir. Now, both are similar in their efficacy, although Tenofovir is a little more nephrotoxic, so in those patients we use it. But they are able to control the virus. Hepat compared to Hepatitis C, the difference here is that in Hepatitis B, we do not have, these drugs cannot cure the virus, it can only control the virus. So generally, uh, these patients... Uh, have to take these antivirals lifelong. Sometimes when we uh, stop the antiviral after uh, uh, achieving HBS, neg HBS antigen negativity as well as DNA being negative for maybe a few months to few years, hepatitis B can come back in these patients and sometimes very aggressively it can come back in these patients. So therefore, with the current antiviral treatment, we can keep hepatitis B under control, but we cannot cure it. There are some developments in uh, uh, research trials very uh, in the last few years where there is a potential that we will be probably able to cure hepatitis B also in the future. The next big disease that we face currently is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or uh, NAFLD. Now, as we know that from a healthy liver, the uh, path to cirrhosis is first there will be simple accumulation in the fat which means we do an ultrasound we will see fatty liver the next step is called as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis where not only we will see fatty liver on the ultrasound but also the lft will show that there is some abnormality there will be raised sgot raised sgpt and all that and the fourth stage is cirrhosis the first and the second stages of the disease are reversible so if somebody finds fatty liver and if they start losing their weight, controlling their diabetes, controlling their cholesterol, all the risk factors for developing fatty liver, then it can come back to absolutely normal liver. We know this for sure because there are certain situations in which there is a um, person who wants to donate liver for a transplant of one of their family members. 
and then they we do an ultrasound and we find that they have fatty liver we make them exercise and in 4 to 6 weeks the entire fatty liver goes away and they can successfully be donors for their patients also family members also so therefore we know that patients who have fatty liver or even non alcoholic state of hepatitis their disease can be reversed and a healthy liver can be achieved so whenever somebody finds fatty liver on ultrasound on a routine ultrasound do not ignore it please investigate it further to see how much of damage is there and then impress upon the patient that this is a reversible situation avoid going into the irreversible situation of cirrhosis and they will benefit hugely from this now although there are uh, various ways we can uh, uh, treat fatty liver or any fld the mainstay of their treatment is lifestyle intervention such as diet and exercise and sometimes we do bariatric surgery also to help them reduce their weight but unfortunately if they develop late stage nafld then uh, or cirrhosis then their only option is to do a liver transplant so who are the patients who should be considered for treatment in uh, with fatty liver so patients who have a high bmi uh, especially with truncal obesity diabetes high triglycerides hdl which is very low or high blood pressure basically metabolic syndrome patients these are the patients who should be kept a close watch for fatty liver and if they do develop it try to reverse it by controlling these risk factors the next big disease we see is alcoholic liver disease so this is one of the most favorite questions by the audience is to how much alcohol can i take safely the main uh, thing here is the cumulative damage to the liver because of the amount of alcohol and every type of alcohol is alcohol you know a lot of people will think that if you take beer then it doesn't harm as much or if you take a, a, you know a, a english or a foreign liquor then it doesn't harm as much sorry that doesn't work every for your liver for your body alcohol is alcohol so we use a thing called as unit of alcohol which is equal to 30 ml of a hard liquor is equal to 10 grams of alcohol about 100 ml of wine which is approximately one glass of wine is again 10 grams of alcohol and about 250 ml of beer which is 10 grams of alcohol each of these is one unit of alcohol a safe limit is up to 3 units per day up to 10 years this is cumulative so if somebody takes alcohol for 20 years then they have to have less than uh, half of this so this is the amount of alcohol this is safe for somebody because the liver has the capacity to regenerate beyond this the there will be cirrhosis and it will be difficult for the liver to regenerate although there are anecdotal cases where sometimes patients people have taken much more alcohol and they don't get liver disease and with uh, less disease or less alcohol usage also people get liver disease now here it's important to mention that uh, uh, generally the metabolic uh, capacity of uh, uh, women is lesser than men by about one third so therefore Uh, for them restriction of alcohol is even more important uh, so once we have all these four reasons why you have uh, somebody can develop liver cirrhosis how do we know what's the disease or severity of liver disease so to determine that we use two scores one is the child fuck uh, turcot score ctp score which i am sure all of us will remember from our mbbs days which has uh, points for bilirubin albumin prothrombin time encephalopathy ascites and once you calculate these uh, points then you can figure out how much uh, what's the severity or class of uh, liver disease a b or c and then accordingly we can determine what is their risk of uh, uh, mortality based on uh, their liver disease severity so it's a very simple uh, thing to determine but the more commonly used now is called as meld score model for end stage liver disease score which is also used for organ allocation during transplantation and there is a newer score called as meld sodium meld dash na meld sodium score so this is a very accurate score which tells us how bad the liver disease is and a score can the, the meld score can go from 6 to 40 and anybody who has a meld score of less than 9 their uh, the mortality risk because of liver disease is between 2 to 4% anybody with 10 to 19 score has a mortality risk of 6 to 27% between 20 to 30 is 50 to 60 75% and more than 40 meld score they almost have 100% risk of mortality because of the liver disease the second is acute liver failure 
acute liver failure like we discussed is when a healthy person with no pre existing liver disease has sudden liver failure and the common causes is hepatitis a hepatitis e drug induced liver injury and uh, retol poisoning and some other poison so the most common ones are hepatitis a and e almost 80% of acute liver failures are because of hepatitis a and e thankfully this is a self resolving infection and this is the most common what we call as jaundice that uh, everybody faces during rainy season especially where because of contaminated food or contaminated water a child or somebody will get a jaundice now this because this is self resolving infection even uh, it will resolve in about 3 to 6 weeks anyway if during this period they go to a doctor they don't go to a doctor or they go to a baba it doesn't matter it will resolve in 3 to 6 weeks and that is why jaundice is being treated by all uh, uh, babas in the country because it works even if they don't do any treatment they will still work so it's a self resolving infection we don't need to do anything about hepatitis a or e we just need to diagnose that it is because of this rather than any other uh, sinister virus and uh, you can just leave these patients alone they will resolve except if they develop encephalopathy if any patient with hepatitis a or e develops encephalopathy then that is acute liver failure and these patients need to be seen by a hepatologist immediately the second is drug induced liver injury there are three mechanisms by which drugs various drugs can cause hepatotoxicity and uh, the uh, list of uh, uh, drugs that can cause it are the ones that we commonly use even amoxicillin is in this list and most of the anti tb drugs are in this list so therefore we have to be careful about these drugs we can't stop using these drugs but whenever we find a drug that is known to be hepatotoxic it is best to check a liver function test in about one week to two weeks from starting the molecule because in that situation it will be possible for us to stop the drug in a timely manner and change to another alternative and stop uh, progression of the hepatotoxicity now this is something that we commonly do for uh, nephrotoxic drugs for example if you are using amikacin you would like to check, check creatinine but unfortunately it is not common practice for us to check hepat uh, liver function test when we use hepatotoxic drugs so we, i would encourage everybody that we should start doing that uh, in the future then the third big problem that we face and i would like to talk about is liver cancer or hcc so in uh, 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 any patient with liver cirrhosis or hepatitis b has a high risk of developing liver cancer also called as hepatocellular cancer or hcc as we all know now the problem with liver cancer again is that it's a very asymptomatic disease because the liver is uh, located behind the rib cage and there is a lot of capacity in the liver so the function gets does not get affected so uh, you know just to give you an idea when there is liver cancer we do a liver resection which is the surgery to remove the liver cancer and one can safely remove 75% of the liver without any effect on the liver function so even if the liver cancer is occupying up to 75% of the liver it may not produce any uh, effect on the liver function test at all so therefore these patients do not and the other thing is that the liver is not a pain sensitive organ only when any disease causes stretching of its capsule that is when the patient will have a dragging or a dull aching pain otherwise it doesn't produce any pain so therefore in absence of any symptoms in absence of pain in absence of any abnormality in the liver function test often we diagnose liver cancer also when a ultrasound is done for some other reason so therefore uh, there is a protocol that we follow where any patient with hepatitis b or liver cirrhosis which has basically pre malignant conditions for liver cancer they should undergo an ultrasound every 6 months that will help us diagnose this kind of a situation early now in case somebody does develop a liver cancer how do we normally treat it so one of the options is called as tes or tear this is chemotherapy or radiotherapy that is given directed into the liver now the cancer of the liver the hcc is quite a resistant tumor it is resistant to chemotherapy as well as radiotherapy so if we were to give it normal iv route 
then it will be very toxic. So therefore, what we do is we do an angiography of the liver, identify the blood vessels that are supplying the tumor, and then we'll inject doxorubicin into that uh, tumor and then block the blood vessel also. So the tumor will get doxorubicin in a high concentration. The blood supply to the tumor will be cut off and there will be no systemic uh, 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 side effects of the uh, chemotherapy. So therefore, this is called as TASE, trans-arterial chemoembolization. And this is one of the most common ways we treat uh, HCCs. A similar uh, option is TEAR, that is trans-arterial radioembolization. So uh, just like chemotherapy, we have small beads of radiation that uh, Y90, yttrium 90 beads. So we can inject yttrium 90 beads into the liver uh, tumor also, and that will cause damage to the liver over uh, the next few weeks. So that is, uh, uh, these are the, this is one of the options. So chemotherapy and radiotherapy, transarterial is one of the options for uh, HCC. The second option is what is called as radio frequency ablation or microwave ablation. So in which this is suitable for small liver tumors, in which what we do is we put a needle into the uh, tumor and then it will open up like an umbrella, like a, a spikes. And then we will uh, burn the tumor. Now for small tumors, this works really well. And the tumor can be completely taken care of with this uh, thing. But in either chronic liver disease with cirrhosis or a patient with acute liver failure or patients with liver cancer, if they develop a disease which is not possible to treat with any of these, then we have to think about a liver transplant. And mind you, this is the only transplant that is a treatment for any type of cancer. For no other organ can a cancer be treated by a transplant. So in a transplant, what we do is we will replace the cirrhosis, the cirrhotic liver of the patient. This is how a cirrhotic liver will look with a normal liver of the patient. Now, this is how a cadaveric liver transplant is, where most of the times what we do is we just remove the entire liver of the patient and put in a new full liver into the patient. Now, the, why should we remove the entire liver of the patient, the cirrhotic liver? There are two reasons. One is it's the largest organ in our body and there is no space for two livers inside our abdomen. So it has to be done for that reason. But like we discussed, liver cirrhosis is a pre-malignant condition. So in case we leave the liver behind, then in the future, it will almost certainly develop liver cancer. So therefore, it is best to remove the entire liver and then change it to a new liver. So the entire liver, along with all its blood vessels, along with its bile duct, everything is connected generally takes about 10 to 12 hours and then a transplant is successfully done. We can see the bile being made by the transplanted liver immediately on the table. And then there will be uh, patients' blood tests that will start improving and a lot of things will happen. But it's uh, very routinely done and very successful modality for treatment of liver cirrhosis. The other option is to do a living donor liver transplant. Now, because liver has this ability to regenerate, what we can do is we can just take half the liver or one lobe of liver from a living donor, a family member, and we can use it to transplant into a patient with cirrhosis. And that liver, the half liver, will regenerate, regrow back to normal size in about three weeks' time, both in the donor as well as in the recipient. So because of this unique ability of the liver, we are able to do a living donor transplant also. Now, uh, the success of a living donor transplant depends on how much liver you give to the patient and that depends on what is the patient's weight so typically for most patients most adult patients we have to do, uh, take the right lobe of the donor and give it to the patient for most small children we have to take the left lateral segment which is half of the left lobe of the liver and give it to the child but for smaller adults or for adolescent or teenage children we may be able to do this transplant using the left lobe of the donor which is between the right and the left lobe because you know right lobe is generally about two thirds of the liver volume and left lobe is about uh, one third just about smaller what is the difference between the two types of transplant ddlt stands for disease donor liver transplant the cadaveric liver transplant and ldlt stands for living donor liver transplant where one of the family members donates so there are a lot of people who need a liver transplant and there are only few people who donate organs every year so therefore there is a waiting list which is maintained by the uh, SOTO of the state or by another authority in different states. And 
any time there is an organ donation happening, the first patient on the waiting list will be given that uh, liver. But there is a waiting time of about six months to one year, depending on what blood group it is. On the other hand, there is no waiting time for living donor transplant because immediately they will uh, the donor's uh, testing is done, the patient's testing is done. If both are okay and if we are matching, then you can do the transplant next week. Then the uh, in the process of death, in a cadaveric transplant, there will be some effect on the liver also because of hypoxia, hypotension that are parts of the process of brain death or management of brain death. And therefore, sometimes the effect, the real quality of the liver is not known because and also we have such a short time to do the testing for the liver. We will generally do the hepatitis B, C testing, LFTs and ultrasound. And therefore, there is limited amount of testing that is done before a cadaveric transplant. Whereas in a living donor transplant, the donor uh, will be tested very thoroughly. There will be two types of CT scans, two types of MRIs and several other things, sometimes a biopsy to look for fatty liver. And therefore, we are very sure when we accept somebody for a, being an organ donor, living donor, we know for sure that that person's liver is perfect quality. And therefore, uh, the quality of organ is very predictable. However, like I said, that there is a, uh, the amount of liver that is required for a person for a successful transplant depends on the patient's weight, right? So therefore, for very obese patients, for somebody who's like more than 100 kgs, which is a common problem now because of uh, fatty liver, it will be very tough to find somebody who can donate such a large portion of the liver. So therefore, for obese patients or for patients who do not have a living donor, cadaveric liver transplant or disease donor liver transplant is really the only option. On the other hand, patients who need an emergency transplant who cannot wait for six months to one year, for example, patients with acute liver failure, or patients with liver cancer, they are always better off undergoing a living donor transplant compared to a disease donor. Or the other ones who are very sick, whose liver disease is bad, the MELD score is high, or the CTP class is high, they are better off having a living donor transplant. So, and then there is a very small, minimal risk of the living donor donation also. Although it's small, but it should always, it does always worry us. Uh, the risk of living donor problems with the donor is about 0.3%. But it's something that keeps us uh, awake and worried all the time. So between these two types of transplants, once we see a patient with liver failure, we will advise them which is better or which is more suitable for them. And accordingly, they will choose one of the transplants depending on whether there is a family member who is available for being a donor and their disease severity. And several of these parameters we will take into consideration before suggesting them one or the other type of transplant. So... That was the last slide of mine. So it's not, uh, you know, I, I've taken uh, much less time than I thought I will. But uh, please tell me if there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Mohanka. Uh, so uh, if there are any, any questions, please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi Mohan. Uh, we, we, I was taking a feedback. Everybody has one, one basic question we were discussing. Yes. Like you are working in Mumbai. How much is it, does it cost for a cadaveric liver transplant in the private sector? So the, uh, tra transplant cost is same for living donor or for cadaveric transplant. Okay. Generally, between different hospitals, it will cost between 20 to 25 lakhs. And uh, in the pediatric transplants are generally in a private hospital will cost about 15 lakhs. However, we, I have also been associated with KEM hospital here where, where we did uh, help them uh, with transplant, setting up their liver transplant program. And there the cost of transplant was around 5 lakhs. Sir. So the real cost of consumables, drugs, the preservative solution, everything is about 10 lakhs total. But because about 5 lakhs ka jo medicines are antibiotics hai, or all these medicines are already available in the hospital. So the patient doesn't have to buy. So if you just take out the cost of things that are uh, to be bought by the patient and generally not available in government hospitals, uh, the preservative solution, hai, then some other things that are required like that, it will cost between 3 to 5 lakhs. If you add the cost of antibiotics, antifungals, 
uh, all other drugs, consumables and everything, it will go up to 9 to 10 lakhs. That is the actual cost of transplant. Apart from that, private hospitals add the bed, room, bed cost, ICU charges, all other professional charges. Yes, sab sab mila jula ke, it will go between 15 to 20 to 25 ke beech mein hota hai. So, uh, should be roughly around 20 lakhs, 20 to 25 lakhs. Yes, sir. Okay. And, uh, sir, I wanted to ask that is there any government scheme or any like uh, available for patients on yes. central level or uh, yes. state level? So the, there is no scheme on the at central level, but there are several states that support transplant. Uh, so uh, uh, there, so that is one. So there are states like Karnataka and Tamil Nadu where the government will uh, give a, a certain amount of money sometimes between 15 to 18 lakhs of rupees, uh, but uh, for the transplant as well as three years of immunosuppression medicines for the patient. So that is there in few states. Other than that, the PM relief fund, the CM relief fund also covers transplants very commonly. So a lot of patients uh, get uh, supported from these funds. Then there is a lot of trusts who support transplant also, especially for pediatric transplant, getting funding either through crowdfunding or through uh, one of these uh, trusts is never been a problem. So uh, it is very uncommon that somebody needs a transplant and we are unable to raise funds for that person. It's always possible to raise funds even if the patient cannot afford it. It takes a little more time, you know, one or two months it will take to raise the funds, but through crowdfunding or through trusts, we are always able to raise funds. Right. Crowdfunding has become one of the major... Yeah. Uh, tools through which uh, to create get money. Hanji? Uh, tell some more about crowdfunding you said. So yes. crowd, crowdfunding is so obvious. Okay, Dr. Mahanka, you please go ahead. No, 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 Sunaina, I, I wanted you only to say it that way because <laughs> she is much more knowledgeable about this. Okay, so what there are certain companies uh, such as Milap, okay. Keto, Impact Guru. So they specialize in raising funds for people who can't afford the surgery. So what they do is uh, once you identify, they of course have their list of uh, documents required before they start the crowdfunding for anybody. So that would be the hospital would say that, yes, this uh, person needs this such and such surgery. Uh, they don't have the money. This much is required. Here are the reports. So once they get all those reports and they know everything is above board, then they will go to that person's house, take some photographs, uh, take some videos, find out their whole stories. And then on their platform, they will create a, a campaign, which they will promote. Uh, either they have two different kinds of campaigns. One is a self-driven campaign and the other is a marketing campaign. So self-driven means that the person uh, takes that particular campaign that's created and then sends it to everybody that they know. Um, and they have create, they have raised a lot of money. So for example, if I, I can't afford a surgery, but Impact Guru will create a campaign for me, I will share it amongst all my friends, all my relatives, all my colleagues, my office, everything. It's an online campaign and they can go to the donate button, click that button and there's a target. So for example, if I need 10 lakhs as for the surgery, there will be a 10 lakh target. And so people will, the idea is that people will then forward it and it'll go to other people. Then they will forward it and it'll go to other people. And like that, there will be a domino effect. And even if people raise, give five, 500 rupees or thousand rupees or even hundred rupees, eventually you will reach mm -hmm. that target. So so generally example, on social yeah. media. This is promoted generally yeah. on social, social media. Social media and through your WhatsApp contacts. Of course, WhatsApp is now social media only. And in fact, Impact Guru has raised 16 crores uh, for this one child from Gujarat who needed, uh, I think, just one, uh, it was a very rare disease, it was ACS, I think. Yes, spinal muscular dystrophy, yeah. there yeah. is one injection that cost 18, 16 crores yeah. and they raised that money yeah. to They get raised part. that money four times for four different patients. So uh, sometimes they can't raise 10 lakhs for a very, you know, uh, simple surgery, but they can raise 16 crores through the campaigning for, you know, this kind of thing. So that's how pretty much crowdfunding works. They, of course, keep a part of the, uh, what the whatever money comes in. So about maybe, you know, 5% or 8%, depending on which model you choose. Uh, and they, they have a model where they keep 12%, but then they will market the mm -hmm. campaign online. So, of course, then the reach is much more. So and that's I pretty much how it's, it works. One more question. Yeah, I just wanted to know that there are many tertiary hospitals, um, you know, with they are going for the live as well as cadaveric transplantation. Is there any government organization apart from the medical colleges like our 
uh, you know, it's almost working like a medical college with, uh, we are just 300 bedded uh, secondary level hospital. But we are starting with our transplant, um, uh, on, already cornea started, so we have already applied for uh, liver, lung and kidney. So is there any government organization, because whatever type of problems we are initially we are facing, if we know some organization that, you know, we, that can, for example, the training of the surgeons and, for example, the OT setup and how to get it. So those type of things, because creating a green corridor and after those activities will not be a problem for us. Yeah. The problem is the trained surgeons until how long we are getting. Right now, we are getting an agreement done with our, uh, this PJMAR Chandigarh. So their retrieval team will uh, come or we'll ship the patient that they are deciding on that agreement because the distance is less. But in the long run, maybe maybe by next month we will be getting our license as well. But it is you know long in the long run we want to start our OT and our surgeons should be. The law is silent about the training, the period of surgeons, training period of you know the transplant coordinator. So we are facing a lot of problem about it. So just Tell us the organization where we are doing the fabric in government sector. Yes. So basically, uh, the KEM hospital, which is in Mumbai, is a government hospital where we do cadaveric transplants. So that will be one of the perfect models for you to emulate. Uh, having said right, that, sir. there is ILBS in Delhi, which is not, uh, it's like a autonomous uh, and SGPJ in Lucknow. So these two institutes are autonomous. So they were government uh, set up. But now they run autonomously. So, so SCPJ is again a uh, medical college, no? Yes, yes. So that will be a good uh, model to follow. And ILBS in uh, Delhi, uh, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Dr. Sareen uh, started the institute. So these two will be good. Um, having said that, as far as your training is concerned, uh, except for ILBS, there is not enough volume for your surgeons to get trained. So what I will suggest is that I request any private hospital also, they will be more than happy to do it. So I am in Mumbai. So therefore, if it is possible for them to come to Mumbai, I'll be very happy to uh, guide you about OT, about uh, uh, training and everything. But even in Delhi, there'll be several hospitals who will be more than happy to help you out with this. And if you need help, I can talk to them. I just wanted to time period because we have to spare our surgeons for that. Is it something like these many cases they have to do or it is something like this much period they have to spend? So typically so, to get a good uh, hands-on, uh, you'll need about 50 cases of transplants uh, for liver at least. So what I would suggest is that if there is a person who is already trained at one of the major centers like Medanta or Apollo or, uh, you know, these are the major centers in India, I mean, no. closer to you, Delhi. No. So people who are from, let's say, Panchkula, okay. who have gone and trained there, no. and if they're coming Nothing. back to Panchkula, that will be the best. But if not, then very unlikely that anybody will agree for some a surgeon to go there and spend like six weeks and just give them the surgery to be done because that's going to be tough. So if somebody commits to stay for a year or so, then anybody will uh, so do like a fellowship proper, then it will be possible to train them. You know, so that is the thing because if somebody comes for a few weeks and there are already members in the team who are doing the transplant, it will be very tough for them to let them do the case themselves. They can see that's not a problem, but uh, without a proper uh, and also the law states for liver, kidney and heart, at least for these three organs, there are uh, defined uh, timelines of training that are there in the uh, 2014 rules. So therefore, for somebody to do liver transplant, they have to be MS in general surgery with at least one year of transplant experience in uh, established center. For kidney, they have to be MCH in urology or DNB in urology, followed by transplant training. For heart, it's MCH or DNB in cardiac surgery, followed by transplant training. One, one year each. But for liver, there is only one year of transplant training that is required. So you will also need that person to have that certificate. Thank you so much, sir. One more supplement. Yes, sir. Comparing the live uh, donors versus cadaveric in the liver. Yes. So, in cadaveric, we get the whole liver, and in live, I think we get around 30 to 40 percent maximum we can retrieve. 
So overall, what which is better otherwise? So you're right. What happens is in cadaveric, you will get a full liver, but the quality will always be suboptimal. It will never be perfect. And in live donor, you will get a half liver, but it will be perfect quality. So the results of both cadaveric as well as live donor transplant are exactly the same. Because on one hand, you are getting a perfect quality liver. The half live liver works as good as a hundred percent. Oh, absolutely. Liver. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in three weeks, it will become the same size as the full liver. So the results of both cadaveric and living donor transplant are exactly the same. No difference at all. But otherwise, getting a live donor is much, much more difficult, right? So Sir, it has to be family member only. It cannot be a non-family member. For a live donor in India, uh, there is provision for a family. Even though they may not be direct relatives, they may be like a cousin or somebody, that's allowed. Cousin is allowed. Yes, yes. So, so that means live is much more easier than dead. Because yes. in, in real terms. Which is ah, so, so almost 80% yeah. of the transplants we do in Mumbai or in South India are live donor transplants. 20 are 20% 20 are cadaveric. Yeah. On the other hand, in uh, North, in most of North India, almost 95 to 99% of transplants are live donors and only 1 to 5% is cadaveric yeah. currently. Yeah. So live donor is much e more easier to do because somebody from the family volunteers. Na? Yeah. 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 I have a yeah. question. You said the results of live and deceased are the same in yes. liver. So yesterday I was at the seminar and uh, Dr. Pokhrial had said that for kidney, I mean this unrelated, for, uh -huh. for kidney, uh, live is the results are better Correct. Uh, than deceased. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is because in kidney, the live donor's kidney has been tested and is generally a younger person who is donating. In disease donor, the, it's all, generally the older person is donating and the quality of kidney is unknown and the cold ischemia time, the preservation time is always going to be longer. So because of these three reasons, the results of live donor kidney transplant is much better than disease donor or cadaveric kidney transplant. In liver, it's more or less similar. Thank you. So we, will have so we have read somewhere that in the live donors, the mortality rate is also comparatively higher than... No, so it is higher than kidney donors, of course. So, in the, so just to give you a real perspective of this, the live donors' risk of mortality is 0.3%. So 99.7% that live donor liver has no problem. Although I should say this, that in the last 10 years in India, the number of mortalities, and if you look at the number of mortalities in donors, it will probably be less than 0.1%. So therefore, that is one. Secondly, the live donor kidney mortality is 0.01%. Kidney is, of course, we know. Liver, yeah, so the, liver may it's zero point three percent theoretically, but every unit has got. Uh, I mean, I haven't heard of a donor mortality in the last five years at least. So in the past, we have had donor mortalities in India. I would think because there is a published paper also on this. So about eight to ten donor mortalities have happened in India so far. Total out of about two thousand transplants we do every year. So total India may have uh, probably around fifteen thousand transplants ho chuke honge. Out of that, there have been about 8 to 10 donor mortalities, yes. But none in the last 5 years. So, I think over time, things have improved. We have gotten better. Our post-op care is better. Our selection is better. So, yes. yeah. Right, Ravi, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank sir. So Wonderful. It was very pleasant and I got some very good, interesting discussion. Yes. <laughs> and sir, it's just the beginning. We are going yeah. to bothering you again and again. We'll request you again and again. Anytime, anytime. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much, sir. Thank Dr. you so much for your... Uh, I, I wanted to ask about ABU incompatible liver transplant issue. So I didn't cover the more innovative types of liver transplants today, but we can do income, uh, blood... So normally the blood, uh, liver donation uh, works like your AB uh, blood transfusion, sir. So supposing there is an O group person that person can donate to any group uh, recipient. So 
but in certain situations we can do across the compatibility blood group compatibility also and for that all we need to do is we need to reduce the antibodies in the patient recipient so before transplant for about 2 weeks we do plasma pheresis 2 3 sessions of plasma pheresis and give them anti b antibody rituximab with that so basically uh, for doing a abo incompatible transplant before transplant we need about 1 to 2 weeks of preparation for all these medicines other than that it's a very successful uh, way to do transplants and in kidney also it's very successful actually so is it happening in india and on absolutely. regular basis absolutely absolutely regularly Right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahanka. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Payal, for this wonderful uh, webinar. And we'll be back soon with more. And Dr. Mahanka is also an expert on the law, um, so we can have um, another session with him sometime, whenever he's free. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much for your presence. डॉक्टर पायल दैट्स अ बिग कॉम्प्लीमेंट थैंक यू ओके बाय इट्स नाइस ट्रिक नॉट टू लीव द मीटिंग अर्ली राइट या आई हैव टू सिट एंड सी व्हाट एवरीवन इज सेइंग ओके बाय